Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a series that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will help you better understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have a priest well known to many of you, Father Donald Calloway of the Order of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, the Marian Fathers. He's director of vocations. He's currently in Steubenville, Ohio, but he travels all over the world. Uh, he loves the Blessed Mother, written many books on, on her. And uh, I've asked him today to be on to just answer some basic questions. There's so many misconceptions, misunderstandings on the Blessed Mother. And uh, for those of us who just love her and we wanna share this love of her and that she has for us, I thought it was important to have someone like Father Don to come on the, today. So welcome, Father Don, and uh, welcome. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Brian. I, it's always a joy to be with you, brother. And uh, yeah, let's do our best to maybe clear up some confusion and and get people to understand Our Lady in the correct way, because she's she's amazing, and 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 God loves her, and and we should too. Well, you know, people come up to me in the community if they are ill or they have a loved one that's sick or this COVID time and pray for me and this and that. And Catholics, we ask the saints and the Blessed Mother to intercede for us as well. Uh, could you share with us, are we, why don't we just take it to Jesus? Uh, you know, we hear that all the time. And how does that tie into our Catholic philosophy of the co communion of saints? Yeah, well, you know, these are good questions because um, a lot of people are confused about these things. And you know, ultimately, we, we are taking it to Jesus. But here's the incredible thing. Um, Jesus is so good that he shares, you know, um, his, his desire uh, with us to be a family, to be a part of his family. So what is a family, right? You've got a mom, you've got a dad, you've got children, and, you know, they're siblings. And um, it, it's shared. It's togetherness. It's communion. And so um, in the family of God, everything definitely is all about God. He's the greatest. He's the highest. Uh, but, you know, he's so good that he wants us to be in communion with one another, and he wants us to help each other. So, you know, what I've encountered sometimes, because I have many family members myself who are not Catholic. They're either Protestant or nothing at all. And so I've said to them, you know, what's your understanding of prayer? Because you're right, what you said there, Brian, that, you know, they're okay with people praying for them, right? They're like, oh, great, thank you. I appreciate that. So I say, so what is your understanding of prayer? And they'll, they'll say, well, we're taking it to God. And I'm, that's right, that's right. So then how is it that I can pray for you? And yet you may be uncomfortable with us asking the Virgin Mary or another saint to pray for us. And they said, well, that's worship. Well, no, no, it's not. You know, prayer doesn't necessarily mean worship. It can right? And so when we pray to God in adoration, that's worship. That's worship. And we do not do that with the Blessed Virgin Mary. We do not worship the Blessed Virgin Mary. We do not adore the Blessed Virgin Mary. But we do ask her as the mother of Jesus and as our spiritual mother to pray for us, just like you ask me to pray for you, right? And so sometimes when I put it in that way, they're like, oh, I didn't know there were different understandings of the word pray or prayer. So you're saying that when we pray to God, it can also be a form of adoration and worship. Yes, that's right. So when we pray to the Virgin Mary, we're just asking for her to, to bring these intentions to Jesus. Exactly. We're not adoring her. We're not worshiping her. She is really close to Jesus. <laughs> and so we're asking her uh, to pray for us. That's a beautiful way, I think, of, of helping people understand it. You know, when the angel appeared to Mary, Scripture says the words spoken were, Hail Mary, full of grace. Now, I don't think I can ever be full of grace. Uh, explain that to the viewing audience and, and what does full of grace mean? And does that tie in at all to our beliefs on the Immaculate Conception? It's an interesting phrase, right? And, and um, if you, we'll try not to get too technical, but it requires a little bit of, of theology here. You know, if you look at the Greek, right, um, that the New Testament was, was written in, the word that's used there is kekeritomine. So it's, it's a long word, and we just say full of grace. And the word fullness, it means plentitude, right? It means lacking nothing. But in the Greek, kekeritomine, it's a perfect passive participle. Now, I know that can be a little complicated, but basically what that means in English is, hail you who have been 
for a long time now, full of grace. So not just at this moment is the angel declaring her full of grace. She has been that from the beginning of her existence. So we're talking about a unique person in Christianity who from the moment of her conception is full of grace, has the plentitude of grace, is lacking in nothing. And so that's why we call her the Immaculate Conception. Um, she was not born into original sin like you and I were. And yet she still needs God. Remember, as we said in the first question, she's not God, right? She's not the Redeemer. She's not the Savior. She's not the Messiah. She'd be the first one to tell you that. She needs God just as much as we do, but in a unique way. That's the Immaculate Conception. And um, yeah, I think maybe we can unpack that as well. Now, sometimes we hear the words, Mary's the new Eve and the new Ark of the Covenant. How does mm -hmm. that tie in? Yeah, so, you know, as Adam and Eve were the, the, the parents of the human family, well, with the New Testament, we have a new Adam, Jesus, the head of the human family, right? It's all about him. But we have a new Eve as well, the, the mother of all the living. That's what Eve was called. Now we have a new Eve, and that Eve is Mary. And, you know, a lot of the fathers of the church, they talked about this uh, recapitulation, this, this recalibrating things through Jesus and Mary, correcting what our original parents did wrong in their disobedience, Adam and Eve. Now we have Jesus and Mary, and they're, they're obedient, even unto, you know, that giving of everything. And so that's the understanding. And that's been there from the very early, you know, church is that the, the Virgin Mary is, is, is the new Eve and the Immaculate Conception. And, and this maybe is what I was alluding to earlier. And I think it's important to, to kind of unpack a little bit because people might say, well, if she's not, you're saying she's not God, Father, but you're also saying she's free from sin. Then why does she need a savior? Why does she need Jesus herself? Well, the Virgin Mary is redeemed, but in a greater way. She needs Jesus just as much as we do, but because she is the new Eve, the mother of all the living, a mother can't give what a mother doesn't have. So instead of her being born into sin, God preserves her from falling into the pit of sin uh, at her conception. So we, when we're born into sin, we're kind of born into a pit, so to speak. And Jesus, our Savior, gets us out of that pit, right? Well, God prevented Mary from falling into that pit from the beginning um, so that she could be our spiritual mother, so that she could help us acquire what she has been gifted with at the beginning of her existence, to be free from sin. You know, we're not, we're not the Immaculate Conception, but we are called to be without sin, blemish, spot, or wrinkle, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, holy and immaculate. So that's pretty extraordinary. And again, it's because we're a family. We've been welcomed into the family of God. So we've got a heavenly father. We've got our spiritual mother. Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, our, our God, our King, and our older brother who has invited us into this family. That's just wonderful stuff. And is it really Our Lady, Jesus's gift to us, like what he said from the cross to, to John? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And what a gift she is, right? I mean, think about how tremendously holy, how pure, how humble, how loving, how sacrificial that she was, and to be able to share that gift with others. You know, I mean, it's one of Jesus's greatest gifts. That's why he says to John, but not really just to John, you know, and again, in the early church, they understood that John represented all Christians. So Jesus is saying, behold your mother to all of his followers. And, you know, here's something I love to tell people, because I lead a lot of pilgrimages, and sometimes my mother, my biological mother, she comes with me on the pilgrimages, and we have a great time. It's just so, so much fun, and people love her. And they'll come up to me sometimes on the trip, and they'll say, Father, your mom is such a delight. What a beautiful lady. You know, Father, we were thinking, maybe tonight at dinner, could we give your mom uh, some flowers? They've actually said that to me on these pilgrimages. And my heart is so touched by that. I think, wow, that's so amazing. I would, I would love for that. That would make her so happy. And in doing that for my mother, you're making me so happy. And in a certain sense, if, you know, you got my attention now, if you want something for me and I have the ability to give it to you, 
consider it done. You've done something nice to my mom. I'm all yours, right? Um, now, it goes the other way too, right? If, if somebody came up to me and said, and they haven't, thank God, hey, father, we like hanging out with you, but we don't like your mom. We, kick her off the bus. We're, we have, you know, she gets in the way. <laughs> well, that's not going to fly. You know, we're not going to be <laughs> super buds. You know, I'll probably let you on my bus, but you might be in the back. It's going to be a bumpy ride. You know, so <laughs> if you diss my mother, that's not going to go well. Well, think about Jesus and his mother. Jesus is not a robot. He's not an angel. He's the God man. He had a human mother and he loves her so much more than we ever could. And so if we honor her, by giving her roses, praying the rosary, especially by, you know, um, maybe singing songs to her, right? We sing happy birthday to our own moms. You know, I think Jesus is okay if we sing about his mother. Um, he's going to be delighted by that. He's going to be honored by that. But if we say nasty things about his mother, mm, I don't know if he's going to like that too much. You know, that was one of my other questions was thinking about this. Are we really insulting Jesus when we honor his mother and i think you answered it very well um you know behind me is an image of the divine mercy i see behind you you have one of our lady and jesus on the cross catholics get accused a lot of worshiping statues and icons and false gods and could you walk us through a reply to that sure yeah and again you know I, even some of my own relatives have said to me why do you guys worship statues and i said well we don't you know you'll, you'll never find in a catechism that the Catholic Church has authored or any documents from popes ever that we worship Mary or that we uh, worship or adore statues, whether to Mary or an angel or a saint. We simply have them just like you would have probably somewhere in your home, a picture of your mother or maybe in your wallet, right? You have a, an image of your mom and your dad, your grandparents or your brothers and sisters. I, I do, I think many people do. And that's okay. I, I think it's common sense that you don't pull that out and incense it. You're going to worship them. It's just a reminder of how much they mean to you. Well, it's the same thing with a statue um, or an icon, for example. It's a window into heaven. It's a reminder uh, for you. And so, no, we, we don't worship statues. We never have and we never will. The Catholic Church has never taught that and never will because that's that would be silly. We would definitely condemn that. It's just like a... Uh, uh, a, a physical way, like a like a picture uh, of them, because we love them that much. So we never really have said Mary is God. That's a misconception. So we, we're not honoring the statues, um, and we're not insulting Jesus when we love his mother. Um, and, and isn't her role really just to bring people closer to her son? Yes, that's that's what she's all about, because she is the greatest disciple of Jesus. She's the one who did his will perfectly. Um, she's the one that gave birth to him, accompanied him all the way to the cross. And then what a torturous agony her maternal heart must have gone through to see him crucified, murdered before her. And yet she you know, cooperated with that as the new Eve, uh, so that the birth of a new humanity could take place. So yeah, we should be so grateful for her role in the life of Jesus, her role in the life of the church, and her role in our lives, because she wants us to be closer to Jesus. That's all she wants. That's her greatest desire. That's her motherly concern is, as she said at Cana, right? Do whatever he tells you. That's, that's what Mary is all about. You know, in my own life, I look back and I think like she's always been there putting up road posts or red flags like don't go right Brian of course I'm like going right you know and, and pulling me back and she's always been there as a, as a loving mother and I think of the Jesus on the Via Dolorosa and when his eyes met Mary I mean that, that had to have been like pure love meeting pure love I, I can't imagine what that yeah. seemed like no absolutely and you know I, I again I just take it back to the the level of me and my own mother, I never want to see my mother cry. I mean, what, what child wants that to happen, to see his mother in agony or in tears or sorrow? And yet, Jesus, think about Jesus, what he was experiencing um, in that, as you said, the way of the cross, the way of sorrow, as he marched towards Calvary to save the world by the outpouring of his, of his blood as the Lamb of God. 
he saw his own mother in, in agony. And that must have been so difficult for him because no son, no daughter would, would want to see their mother um, having a torture like that in her heart. Um, and so when we are a delight to her heart, remember, that's going to be a delight to his divine heart. And um, yeah, I think that's why throughout you know Christianity, so many saints have talked about having a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary of getting close to her because it's not offensive to Jesus. He's very happy when you do that because he knows all that she went through, all the cooperation that she offered uh, with him so that he could save the world. Isn't that like the phrase to Jesus through Mary? Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. I love that phrase. Yeah. I think it was St. Louis de Montfort who uh, kind of coined that phrase and uh, it's very popular now. I mean, uh, you know, even uh, during the pontificate of St. John Paul II, you know, he talked about that totus tuus o Maria, meaning all yours, Mary. And again, Mary's not the end. She's, she's the gateway. She, we go through her to Jesus. And think about it again. Um, Jesus, when he came to earth, a divine person, the second person of the blessed Trinity, God, he didn't just pop out of the heavens as an already formed 33-year-old Messiah, right? Just, no, he, he could have, but he didn't. He came to us through the Virgin Mary. I mean, that's amazing. And so it's okay for us to go to him through her as well. Again, I, I often tell people that this analogy, I love this analogy, uh, chess, the game of chess, right? Um, and for anybody listening, you don't know how to play it. Don't worry. It, it's rather simple. Um, you have two sides, right? A, a black and a white side. You know which team you're on. And it's all about the king. The whole game is about the king. If you get the king, you win. But in this game, there's a queen and she has mobility, any number of squares in any direction, right? And there's bishops, very interesting game. It's very theological. There's bishops, there's pawns, there's knights, there's rooks. But if you cooperate with the queen, you can conquer the enemy. And yet the whole game is not about the queen. But if you fight for the queen, you fight for the king. And so that's something, I think that's why a lot of saints like to play chess. St. Maximilian Kolbe, uh, St. Thomas Beckett, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John Paul II, they love to play chess and many others. I think because of that analogy, it's all about the king. It's all about Jesus. But the Virgin Mary, the queen on that battlefield, she's got power. She, she has got some serious, you know, game. Uh, so we want to be with her because she's going to help us to win the victory for the King, King Jesus. You know, one of my favorite things I like to read about are Marian apparitions. I, our church in our little town in Ohio, where I grew up was the Immaculate Conception. And uh, here we are under the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And I just love reading about, she's appeared all over the world and virtually every country, if not every country. And, um, and yet you hear people say, well, how do they know that's not the devil? Mm -hmm. Didn't they say that to Jesus when he was doing good works in scripture as well? That's right. They sure did. They, they accused him of being possessed by the devil. <laughs> yeah, right. And you yeah. know, you think about all the love and good things she wants people to get closer to Jesus, which is love himself. Yep. That doesn't sound like Satan to me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And Satan. Well, that's why, the, you know, the church has a rigorous process of going through this. It's not uh, something they take lightly at all. Um, and there are theologians of the highest caliber and also people in the, the sociological sciences, you know, whether it's uh, the psychological sciences, whether it's analyzing, you know, the um, the, the phenomena of, a, of an alleged apparition or a locution where somebody hears something, um, they really take them through the ringer to see if they're maybe mentally unstable, if something is off there, or if they're doing this out of pride to get attention or to get money or fame or whatever it may be. And it's a long process. So um, many of them are not approved. I would actually say that the majority of those who allege that they're having apparitions end up not to be appro approved. They may be having some kind of mystical experience and praise God, right? But a lot of times um, the church says, well, we don't deem this to be of a supernatural character. Um, but the ones that do end up being approved, like, you know, Guadalupe, Fatima, Lourdes, 
Um, you've got, you've, there's tons, right? Uh, one of my favorites is Our Lady of La Salette um, in France up in the Pyrenees Mountains. And to me, that's the most beautiful location of anywhere on the, the earth that Our Lady has appeared. It's like, it's just like a mountain paradise and just absolutely incredible. I was only there once because it's actually hard to get to, <laughs> but it was really amazing. And that's an apparition in which Our Lady cried. So remember how I talked about no child wants to see their mother cry. Well, she was crying in that apparition because people were using the name of the Lord in vain and they were doing unnecessary work on the Lord's day. And so that brought her to tears. And so I always remember that, you know, that Mary, I don't want to make you cry. You're my spiritual mother. I want to make you happy. Help me to do things that are pleasing to God, to observe the commandments, to watch my tongue, all those things. So, yeah. I encourage the, the, the listeners to, to check out the, the approved ones and uh, be inspired. You know, for those non-Catholics who may wonder what Catholics are doing with these beads, uh, the rosary, and then we're praying, Hail Mary, full of grace, you know, we're praying to the Blessed Mother, but isn't the rosary just a reflection on the life of Jesus and Mary and the trials? Yeah, yeah, and the rosary itself almost, I think it's 95% of the prayers come out of the New Testament. So it's, it's, it's right out of the Bible. It's, it's a prayer based on the word of God. And so that's powerful because remember, you know, the prophets say the word of God does not go forth without bearing fruit. So if you're praying the rosary, right out prayers right out of the New Testament, you're making a pilgrimage in your mind, in your heart. You're going to Bethlehem. You're going to Calvary. You're going to all these sacred events that saved us um, to, to open yourself, to dispose yourself to the Holy Spirit and be guided by the Holy Spirit, to grow in virtue yourself, to turn away from sin. And, you know, sometimes people have said, and rightly so, you know, it's a good question when they will say, but Jesus said, do not babble like the pagans. Do not say, you know, these prayers that um, are just repetitive and, and, and meaningless. Oh, yes, he did say that, but there's a difference, for example, with what he said, which of course he's right, he, Jesus knows what he's talking about, but this is not a repetitive prayer that is pointless or meaningless. There are those kinds for sure, but the rosary is not one. And here, here's why, you know, even Jesus himself prayed the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms and they are very repetitive. They have a refrain the, you know, for his mercy endures forever. You say a few lines for his mercy endures forever. And you'll keep doing that for quite a while. Very repetitive, but not vain repetition. No, Jesus himself did this form of prayer, right? Well, what the Psalms were for the Old Testament, the rosary is for the New Testament. We're taking those and that angelic salutation, hail full of grace, the Lord is with you. The Our Father prayer given by our Lord himself. And it's not vain when we repeat it, because we're meditating upon these mysteries, and we're basically telling God, I love you, right? Think about this. Two people in love, you never get, an, get, get enough of the other saying to you, I love 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 you, right? You're never going to say, okay, stop, that's enough, right? No, lovers love that, right? Well, that's the same thing. When we say the Hail Mary prayer, not vain repetition, meditating upon Jesus, we're saying to God, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And that, that's very pleasing to him. Well, Father, uh, before we close out today's show, do you have any other thoughts or comments you want to share with us on our, didn't, didn't you write a book? I don't have it in front of me, but on gems of the rosary or something like that? Yeah, I've got um, Marian, oh no, yeah, I've got Marian gems, but also rosary gems, little thoughts from saints and popes every day for, for praying the rosary. And I got several books on the rosary as well, Champions of the Rosary, Ten Wonders of the Rosary. Um, yeah, check those out. And how can, uh, get, how can people get that book? Where do they go to get that? So it's available all over the place, but a real one-stop shop, so to speak, to find it, just go to fathercalloway.com. And you got to spell out the father part. So fathercalloway.com. You'll see all those there. And that link will take you to my religious communities website where you actually purchase the book. So I, I don't get the money for the books. My religious community does. Um, so you can find all that on uh, fathercalloway.com. Great. Father, I really want to thank you again for joining me today on Mercy Unbound. Uh, keep up the 
great work you're doing and uh, direct your vocations for anybody watching this discerning the priesthood. Uh, think about the order and uh, I hope our paths cross again soon. And God Thanks, bless. brother. God bless you too. Thanks, Father. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R, and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. And for more information, go to the website at drbryanthatcher.com.